Everybody, it's Michael Martin. Thanks for being here. Really excited because I get to chat for an hour with one of my really, really good buddies for a long time, probably 20 years, Sean McLaughlin. You probably know him as Chicago Sean. He works with All Star Charts. How you doing today, buddy? I'm doing great, man. The The market is uh, winding down for the day. It's been a wild week here in my house. Uh, my, my wife just celebrated a big, uh, big round number birthday. I threw a surprise party for her this weekend. Uh, we had people coming in from out of town. They finally just left yesterday. So the week is winding down. That's right. When the party's over, everyone has to go at the same time. As I like to say, get out of my house. I want my space back. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Well, well, happy birthday to uh, Mrs. Chicago. Um, hope she has a good more, many more big round numbers on her on on her way. We like we like That's theta so. in this case, right? <laughs> That's right. That's right. So speaking of, the reason I, I don't do interviews all the time is because I really like to think about the the emotional and the psychological aspect of trading. But what happens is if you say one or two things about options, you get a thousand responses from people. And although I can speak from my own experience, I thought what I would do today is bring in Sean, who's a real options pro, get a different opinion. You can hear it from another angle. And if that helps you, that helps you. It's all for free. Um Sean, one of the things that I get, and I kind of razz people about it, so they kind of feel antagonized, but I want to have a little fun with people, is this whole zero DTE thing. My take on it is that it's a real trap for small retail traders and that they're better off paying more money for time value, give themselves a chance to win. I know there's training programs out there where you got a bunch of teachers and they can, I'm sure, help you if you're lucky enough to have access to that. But the majority of people are doing it at home. They're doing it your DIYers, right? Do it yourself. So when you think about it and your role in All Star Charts, what's your take on zero DTE? Call me an idiot if I'm wrong. I mean, I don't. No, care. you're not an idiot. Uh, look, uh, it's 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 right that you're asking about it because the the volumes in zero DTE options uh, are exploding. In fact. Mm. Um, Options expiring today and tomorrow, so like zero DTE and one DTE, yeah. uh, are almost equal to all the rest of the options volume out there. So, yeah, we should be talking about it. Now, I take issue with people who think that uh, the zero DTE options are a new way to make money. Um, in my experience, and, and I can only speak from my experience, right, Michael? But yeah. I've dabbled with them. I've dabbled with them a lot, and I've had some success, but... I have not come up with anything that's unique or different uh, in zero DTE. That's certainly uh, anything repeatable that I know I can rely on to make money every day. My my thought on what's going on with zero, T, zero DTE options is they are great instruments for people who want to people and institutions, I should say, who want to hedge, uh, you know, event specific risk, something that's, you know, very binary, very short term, you know, like a, yeah. a, a, they know there's a big government report coming out the next morning or something like that. I think they're great instruments for, for affordable hedging, but mm. for people who are trading them purely as speculative instruments, um, they're very challenging because if you're buying them, right, then that yes. means that means the clock is so is working so quickly against you. You got to be your timing has got to be nearly impeccable if you're buying these options. On the flip side, if you're selling them, you're taking on a lot of risk for very little reward if a big move happens, if we have a big rip uh, that you weren't expecting for, even if you just like stepped away to go make yourself a sandwich or something and you come back and the market ripped, you know, 20 points in your, uh, in your face. Yeah. You're taking on a lot of gamma risk for very little relative reward. So, so for people who are uh, coming at zero DTE options with a speculative mind, I don't know. I, I I haven't found a way to make money with that consistently yet. But for people who want to use them for hedging, I think they're fantastic because yeah, you can get very specific, very dialed in on the specific day you want that risk hedged for, and you could do it. Uh, especially if it's very short term, you could do it very relatively cheaply. So there, there's my take. Yeah, I like what you said about you know hedging these binary events. Don't forget, if there are nine binary options, we have to refer to them as they them. So oh, that's the environment so, we live in now. Yes, that's the environment we live in. We have to refer to non-binary options as they them. 
So I admit, like I've tried them too, just because I like to speak from an experiential standpoint, Uh, because theories, who cares? It's like belly buttons. Everyone's got one. And I don't really mean belly button, but this is a rated PG show. I think my guess is that they're people who have smaller accounts. And for some reason, they have this enormous fear about theta. But if they're day trading and swing trading, my take is who cares about theta at that point? Because if you think the instrument's going to move sharply in the direction, like if you're long calls, you think the thing's going to move up. What do you care about theta? You know, if the underlying's going to move 10 bucks, you know what I'm yeah. saying? Like to me, it's kind of irrelevant. You're overthinking no, I get stuff. It. I get it. There's There's an entire cottage industry of options practitioners who – swear yeah. by only selling premium. And I have no problem with that. Selling premium is, yeah. if that's your if that's your bag, I know plenty of people who are very successful doing that. The issue is they're they're doing it on longer timeframes. They're, they're selling premium in options that are, you know, have six months or six weeks expiration, eight weeks expiration. They're not doing it yeah. on an option that expires tomorrow. Um, at least not the ones that are making any money consistently. Yeah, and we I speak to timing. Like I I admit there's probably like three dozen people out there who who can do this. But but for the shorter term stuff, man, your timing has to really be impeccable. So that's my gripe about everyone trying to sell these swing trading and day trading programs, is like you can look over the shoulder and see what they're doing and understand it intellectually. But in order to have the sense of timing that they have, that to me is a whole other skill. And it almost has nothing to do with the puts and the calls part. You know what I'm saying? Like there are just people out there who have a really good sense of how things unfold. And options can certainly be a way to capture that, you know, while minimizing the risk. And, you know, let's not forget if some of the high flyers out there, you know, everyone has an opinion now about NVIDIA and how AI is going to change the world. You know, you're looking at 700 bucks a share. So yeah, you can, you know, buy a call as a surrogate, I suppose. but to buy it for two days, you know, because the premium's eight as opposed to like 30 for one month's expiration. I feel like people are kind of misled. And then what happens is you get this kind of, I call it um, Johnny Cochran log- logic, right? If it doesn't fit, you must acquit, right? Hey, man, the glove never fit. OJ, he didn't kill the girl. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, allegedly, he allegedly was involved in that. That's right. So I'm speaking um, as a Buffalo Bills fan, sorry, that's a little close to home. The Juice. I remember The Juice when I was growing up. That was his nickname. So, you know, you hear someone say something over and over and over again, and then you lose your critical thought and you just accept it as being God's honest truth. So my whole thing is like, not only are the better traders that I know really contrarian, but they also question everything, especially in their own behavior. They don't fall in love with their own reflection like narcissists. And, you know, you really have to see the data not necessarily the chart pattern. So thank you for that. It's just, look, so if you're out there and you're trading things that expire within the week, I hope you kill it, right? I'm not trying to call your girlfriend ugly, but there, you know, you need to have a voice of reason. And that's part of what I do here too, because after 36 years, I've seen and heard it all. I, every, you know, I'm not saying that these people are snake oil salesmen, but when I scroll through my Instagram reels, I'm seeing and hearing stuff that is just, laughable. It's like a skit out of Saturday Night Live. And we're going to see that because it's an unregulated market. There's no one to say, hey, you know, you have to have data to back up what you're saying. People can say what they want. It doesn't mean that it's true. Um, right on. Let's talk about risk management, right? So you can, if you're, deb- I tend to be a debit, a debit buyer myself. I'm like long calls, long, sh- long, long calls, long puts. So I have an idea of what the worst case is. I almost never stick around if the thing is moving against me to let the whole thing go to zero. I'm kind of trading out of it, right? So what do you think uh, uh, someone who's just starting out in options to do? Should they take their risk unit and make that like 100% of the premium? Or should they buy several multiples of that? So in other words, if they have a million dollars account or 100K, they want to risk 1,000. Do they put $1,000 in debit balance? Or can they put as much as like three, four, five, and then get stopped out at say eighty percent after they've risked their thousand? How do you look at that? Probably with respect to leverage. The way I look at it is, I like to always plan for the worst case scenario, um, and, and, mm-hmm. and I have a perfect recent example of this, and this is in Snapchat. 
Um, I had a position mm-hmm. in Snapchat coming into the debacle that happened uh, this week where the stock lost 30% overnight. Um, I had a, uh, a a calendar spread on, which I, we won't get lost in the nuts and bolts of it, but just know that it's a defined risks uh, position. The debit that I paid when I put the spread on a month ago is the absolute most I could lose in a worst case scenario. And you know what? After what happened this week, I was very happy knowing that my risk was defined. And so I lost, I didn't lose 100% of my trade, but I lost probably 90%. But that's fine because the position was sized in a way that had I suffered the full loss, it was a loss just like any other loss, totally acceptable within the realm uh, uh, realm of what's acceptable for my size account. So I always approach risk management from the worst case scenario when I'm, when I'm doing options trades with defined risk. I want to know what that worst case is. And yes, to your point, I do use stops. I do get out with a, if a mm-hmm. chart pattern is broken that I was uh, leaning against, or if the, the spread or the option that I'm in loses a certain percentage of its value typically, but not always like, it's just keep it simple. Say I'm long a call. If the call, if, if the chart isn't necessarily broken, but it's just going nowhere. And my call that I bought for $5 is now trading at $250. It's lost half of its value. Generally, I'll cut my losses at that point, even if the chart still agrees with me. Um, yeah. But again, I know what the worst case scenario is. It could go to, it could be a zero and I'm fine with that. So that's how I think about yeah. it, Mike. I, yeah, try to keep it, keep the, the, the worst case scenario in mind at all times. Okay. That's a good answer. So, I think of this, I think the same way. I I I think for for certain positions um where I, I try to have constant risk. I do know markets can gap. When I'm trading well, I tend to trade more aggressively. That's a discretionary element to my own practice. But the thing that I wrestle with is like if you take in the series 7, they'll say if you buy a thousand shares of of, a, of an instrument, don't buy more than ten contracts, right? And it looks good on paper because you don't want to over leverage your account. The thing is, is that you're giving away a lot with that type of model. And what am I talking about? We're talking about delta, right? Delta of any underlying is one. But if I'm buying, you know, something at the money, your delta is going to be about fifty. Obviously, gamma is going to be super high. But I think, you know, in terms of position sizing, I try to balance both the premium with also the Delta, because I know if I've got the calls and there's a gigantic move, I'm not really going to participate in it all that much. Although, you know, you can get, I'm sure you know the numbers, the Delta is going to increase the more in the money it goes, but that's still a bit of a haircut that you have to take. So, you know, I always try to think like, okay, balance, how much premium do I have at risk in terms of debit or net debit? I'm really not a net debit guy, meaning spreader or, or, or broken wings. Um, but then I think about like, what am I getting? What What is the bang for the buck that I'm getting? Do you look at deltas too when you are looking to establish whatever structure you're going to put on? Yeah, uh, certainly if there is a, a trade that I like, and uh, again, let's keep it simple with just simple long calls. If I look at that trade from the perspective of a stock trader, and let's say a thousand shares is my 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 trade size, then but but I don't want to uh, tie up that much capital that would be required to buy a thousand shares of the stock, right? Yeah. What I would often do is I would go into the options market and buy enough calls to target that delta. So in this case, uh, if I wanted to have a thousand deltas, which is what a thousand shares would be, right? If I if I was long a thousand shares, that's equivalent to a thousand deltas. Yeah. Uh, I would buy uh, what is that? Two hundred calls uh, to 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 target that that same size. Am I doing my yeah. math right? I think yeah. Or 20 calls. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's the end of the day, Michael. Wish. I'm fried. I can't, my, my, I can't do the math in my head. Anymore. I know you just had the birthday party and all those pain in the ass people. At I know. House. I understand. But anyway, I, I would size my call position so that the Delta would equal a similar sized stock position, mm. but the benefit being I'm tying up less capital. I'm tying up less buying power so that I can maybe yeah. diversify my risk in another trade that is uncorrelated, right? Like, People do that all the time. It's something I will do from time to time. Um, But what I'll be mindful of is if I do that, I know that whatever premium I pay for those calls, that's, that's my max, my max risk. Right. So yeah, 
if I'm putting myself in a situation where the, the, the max risk is larger than what I'm comfortable with, then I have a decision to make. The decision right. is, do I want this much leverage with calls? Uh, can, yeah. can, can I maybe take a smaller position and I'll get to that target delta eventually if the trade moves my way? Yeah. Or do I, you know, get a little creative and maybe, you know, buy some hedges, maybe buy some out of the money puts just, you know, just in case. I mean, there's a lot of different ways. And you kind of hinted at it at the top of this call about how with options trading, uh, you know, there's lots of different ways to skin the cat. And that's both challenging and frustrating to people, but also a great opportunity. It's challenging because a lot of people, especially people who come from the binary world of futures where you, you buy or sell and that's it. You know, people don't like that the answers are black and white, They're, that they aren't black and white. Like if X happens, you do yeah. one. Like yeah. in options, it's, you know, there's lots of different, there's no right answer. And people want right answers. People crave right answers, right? They want to do it right. Well, I'm sorry to tell you that if you're bullish and I'm bullish on the same instrument, you and I could trade it with options in two completely different ways. And we could both make money. We could both lose money or one could make and you yes. lose. It's like, it, yeah. that frustrates people. But I like it. <laughs> I like them because you can really carve out your risk. And that to me is the nature of trading. Like it's so not about entries. To me, it's all about position sizing more than anything. Mm -hmm. If you looked at my, I'm like the Jimmy Page of trade entries. I have really good licks, but I'm sloppy as hell, right? Whereas there's other guitar players who can hit every note all the time. But Jimmy Page is all balls, right? And that's kind of more my style of trading. So what I try to do is I try to carve out like where's the risk? Where's the upside? I, I, unlike a lot of folks, I don't really get out of bed if I can't five some, find something where at least looking on the chart, I can see a five to one type of ratio. This way, when it works out, my winners can pay for a whole bunch of losers. And like you said, sometimes they stall. So I do use time stops as well. Um, yeah, that's actually I, something, I, I mean, I've always been aware of time stops, but um, yeah. certainly in the past year, I've made a much more concerted effort to focus on getting out of the trades that just aren't working, you know, quickly. Now, you know, I'm not being greedy, but, you know, I look back at my trades over the past, I don't know, four or five years that we've done stuff with all-star charts. And I've noticed, Michael, that all of my biggest winners, the trades that really like made my year every year, those mm. trades, not every time, but almost every time they started ripping right away. Maybe not the minute I got into it, but you know, within a day or two yeah. or certainly yeah. within a week, it started going my direction and never looked back. Yes. And certainly I had trades that I sat in for six months and then finally worked for me. And that's, oh, that's great. But yeah. I adopted the mindset of, you know, if all my biggest trades that make my year are all trades that start working right away, then what am I doing sitting in all these trades that are tying up capital for weeks at a time, months at a time doing nothing. I would rather get out of those things yep. a lot quicker at the risk of maybe yeah. getting out of a trade that would have worked eventually. But you know, the numbers work yeah. in your favor when you do that. God has spoken these words and I do that with futures, which allows me to trade with bigger size. Like I don't look at myself as a day trader. I'm more position trading, but if I do put on a trade, I don't want to see red, you know, I, I, and sometimes I'll be like in, out, in, out, in, out, mm -hmm. just because I'd rather trade with the size, not that I'm trying to sit here double clicking my mouse all day, but I want to get in on the trade with the right timing, then have the thing move in my favor. I can then adjust my stops and it really helps me live in a, a very placated lifestyle in that regard. It looks sloppy as hell because there's a lot of false starts. But the key is, is to get the right amount of risk on at the exact right time. And I don't have time, like you were saying, I don't have time to sit there to wait. I had some puts on Disney a while back and I literally got paid the last day. And I was like, this is bullshit. I'm not doing this anymore. And I, I made like 20% on the actual trade. So whatever, if my risk unit was 1%, you know, I made, I cleared out 1.2 net of commissions. So it wasn't even anything really to write home about. So it was more of an emotional win or, a, you know, like a theoretical win. It's not a win-win. Certainly not one that I want to get involved in and replicate because there's no money in it. Right. But I think the key here is position sizing on, you know, just to take an aside, I wrote about in the inner voice about um, the inner voice of trading being long live cattle, feeder cattle. 
when Mad Cow hit the tape. Hey, I don't know if you can see over my shoulder, but right on my oh. bookshelf over there, I've got the inner oh. voice of trading right there on my bookshelf. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Sean. That's very sweet of you to say. Um, but man, that was painful because obviously futures, commodity futures are not options and you have unlimited loss potential regardless of whether you're long or short. The key was position sizing. And the thing was limit move against me like five days. And that's 1500 bucks a contract. You know, you're getting blasted. But the problem is, is that people see that and now they, they extrapolate it and they say, see, that's why I'm not trading futures. Now, I've been trading futures for 36 years and I can think maybe including that one, maybe two or three total times where I had limit moves against me. Um, I think options provide a good vehicle for folks who are learning how to take risk home and take risk home over the week, overnight over the weekend because it gives you a little staying power because you already can define what your max loss is, right? So I think – there is a bit of a misconception and, and a fundamental un- misunderstanding of, of risk. Risk in and of itself is not bad. It's how you handle it. To be honest with you, and I make this joke when I speak publicly, I trade futures more conservatively than people buy and hold their 10-year treasury notes. You know what I mean? Like those yeah. things are all over the place. They look like my Uncle Vinny's EKG after a big meatball parm and three liters of Coke. <laughs> my futures equity account, you know, when you trade your equity curve, so you can take and trade it a very aggressive or risky instrument, but trade it conservatively. I think that's what Sean was saying. So do you ever find yourself, Sean, where like you're in a long call and a long put and you're like, hmm, the finance, the financing of this thing is a little rich for my account size. Let me sell away some of the upside and create like a spread or or um, do you do you ever do that, like ratio spreads or back spreads? Oh, a- absolutely. Um, okay. One, once I've once I've determined whether or not I'm bullish on a position or bearish on a stock or neutral on stock, once I've decided my directional bias, then the first thing mm-hmm. I look at is where is the implied volatility in the options. Now, for newbies out there who have no idea what I'm talking about, implied volatility is just a measure of of the expensiveness of the options premium, right? When implied volatility is high, that means that you're paying a lot more to say buy an at the money call versus when volatility is low, the premiums will be much cheaper. And so I want to know where the implied volatility is. I don't care so much about the actual number that like will pop up on my screen. The volatility is 0.8294. No, I don't care about that. I just care about where is it now compared to where it's been over the past, you know, six to 12 months. If it's in the upper third of the range, then I know that volatility is high. And in that case, I want to be putting on some kind of spread trade in most cases, or maybe I want to be selling premium, just being naked puts or, you know, maybe a, a strangle. Um, on the flip side, if volatility is cheap, then that gives me a little bit more comfort to maybe just buy a straight call if I'm bullish or buy a straight mm-hmm. put if I'm bearish. But but implied volatility yeah. is, is, you know, number one a in the steps for me in determining what i'm going to do to express my 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 thesis thanks for saying that i mean with options man it's like to me futures are so clean right you have supply and demand there's no you know abby joseph cohen there's no fed banker central banker there's no axe that can really tell you where beans or cocoa or or sugar are going to go and that to me is kind of disruptive because, you know, if you're in those positions overnight over the weekend, you know, I don't any more than any type of trader who's whether it's day trading, one minute bars or, you know, position trading and holding things overnight like I do. No one likes surprises, right? I don't want to wake up and find that somebody, you know, just upgraded or downgraded or that there's even just bad news coming out of the company like, you know, Refco halted. Ooh. Auditor resigns. CFO was days. arrested. <laughs> Man, that was that that hit that Refco thing hit me hard. Um, they had actually allocated money to me, so that was once I saw that, I knew I knew the gig was over. Um, I, so let's I, talk I, about. I ran a small uh, commodities fund back in oh three to oh five, and uh, I cleared through MF Global, and uh, I moved no. to another firm. 
luckily, maybe six months before that uh, that whole thing blew up, uh, I could have been ensnared yeah. in that as well. That was the John Corzine bond trade thing? Yep, yep. Yeah. Yeah, I was affected by both because when I started out and I went out on my own, I cleared EDNF Man basically my whole career. So, yeah, he ruined that company. I mean, that company went back to 1794 or something. Um, yeah. So let's talk about when you are making money, right? Um, there's so many things to measure, right? You talked about implied volatility. You have historical volatility. And then you have a whole sl slew of Greeks. You have charm. You have all of this. If someone's just starting out, this is overwhelming. There's so many things to know. So many things like, hey, my car won't start. <laughs> well, what is it? Is the battery not charged? Do you not have enough fuel? Is the are the are the two you know the the battery connectors corroded? Like, what? Where do you start to go through your checklist of what's material or not? My take on things for any asset class is to really keep things simple because the simpler models are easiest to run. They can be profitable, and then when they start to break, you could at least see what the hell's wrong with it and take a time out. What do you advise, you know, for the newer folks, you know, two years or so of, of experience who are looking at options and they overwhelmed with just the vocabulary sure. of the damn things? Um, that's a good question. And uh, I, I meet people who are new to trading all the time. I, I run a traders meetup group here in Colorado. We get together a couple of times a month. We get new people all the time. And, and they're one of the things that's always said options oh, when they hear that I trade options, like, oh, man, that's complicated. And look, here's the thing yeah. about options. Options can be very complicated. In fact, there are a lot of people, a lot of successful traders out there who run very complicated volatility skew strategies uh, that you need like a PhD in math to even scratch the surface of what they're doing. Yeah, yeah. that yeah, yeah. exists and it's out there, certainly. However, that is not how I trade. Um, I don't know if I'm smart because I keep it simple or if I'm stupid because I keep it simple, but either way, I like to keep it simple and option trading can be very simple if you're willing to, you know, learn a couple terms that maybe you're a little unfamiliar with. And you mentioned the Greeks, uh, the Greeks, all they really do is just, they're just measures that tell you how the, the speed of things are likely to change in the event that X, Y, or Z happens. Um, I always tell people, if you're new to options, don't start getting into multi-legged spreads and don't be selling naked risk. Like these are things that you don't understand and you don't want to learn the hard way. What you yeah. want to do is kind of wade in, <laughs> either just be a straight buyer of calls when you're bullish or be a straight buyer of puts when you're bearish. Or a very common way, and I call this the gateway drug to options trading, is be a uh, covered call writer. If you own stocks, sell covered yeah. calls against your stock and just see how that plays. See how that affects your return streams. See how those short options play against your long stock. Uh -huh. that, that, that's the easy way to get your, your feet wet. So uh, covered yeah. call writing and just buying calls and buying puts. That's it. I would concur. And I'll say this out loud because I'm a guy who looks at the data. I started creating my own trading models using Lotus 1, 2, 3 and kind of writing macros around it. And it's awfully difficult even to get good data on options to back test, right? I mean, so it's, it's very, very difficult. So paper trading, it's not the same. No. As long as there's no real risk, you really need to feel the burn of making and losing money in order to get the education that you want. And I've said it you know, as a guy who had to teach traders of all levels, beginners through institutional people and family offices, the, the best teacher of trading is the actual trading itself. Absolutely. Because so much of you is part of your trading process, right? Sean just said before that we could both, he could be in a spread. I could be in a, in a directional trade on the same underlying instrument and we could both be right and make money. So there's really not any, only one good way. There's the best way for you. And that's probably going to be a reflection of your personality. That's typically how it goes. Um, I'm glad you. I'm glad you brought up back testing because uh, if you don't mind, I'd like to riff on that for a second. I riff, baby. I'm riff. a big fan of back testing. I'm a big fan. Uh, when I traded commodities, mm -hmm. like you trade commodities, I used to run back tests and I used to do trend following strategies, and I wanted to run back tests as far back as I could go to see if what I'm doing has an edge that I can rely on. Big fan mm -hmm. of it. However, in options trading. 
as much as we want to back test, it is really problematic because even in the most liquid options markets, like say like S&P options or, or TLT options, um, SPX options, things like that, even the most liquid options markets, you're still looking at bid ask spreads that are very material, right? Like if you're looking at an option yeah. that's uh, you know, a fair value of two bucks, for example, yeah, the fair value of the option might be two bucks, but the bid might be a dollar seventy five and the offer might be two twenty five. That is a spread you could drive a <laughs> truck through. And yeah, yeah. When you're trying to back test and say, Oh, I would have gotten filled at two dollars the fair value, that's not how the real world works. If it's a fast market and you need to get out, you're hitting that bid and you're getting out at a dollar seventy five, and that's a big difference yes. from two dollars, right? In percentage terms. Yes. Yeah. And you can and you combine that over, you know, hundreds of thousands of trades, those differences are just going to put your numbers right way out of whack. Uh I mean, if if someone yeah. out there has a good way of back testing options, I I'm all ears. I would love to see it, but uh, I I yeah, I don't know how it works. <laughs> yeah, it's got to be something that's custom made because it's just too difficult. Um but back testing can reveal at least right so you miss, right, because there's two payoffs to every trade. There's certainly the financial part, but then there's the emotion, the emotional and the psychological. When you're trading with paper money or using a demo account, you might be frustrated because you can't get the thing to work, but you're not despondent because you lost actual money that you worked hard to get in the first place, right? So there's a really big difference. Absolutely. Sean, how do you go about, you know, if you have a bullish opinion on a certain thing and it's it's showing up on the chart, how do you kind of determine – What's the best, right? Because you have like futures, you have all these different expiration months, which we call the strip, right? And, and term structure in options, you have $5, sometimes $10 increments in strikes. So how do, how do you, is there, a, is there a Greek or is there just a methodology? Is it a gut feel? What should someone look to if they wanted to, you know, if they were bullish on some underlying instrument, you know, where, what call strike should they look at if they were going to buy it? Well, I, I, I'm afraid I might give you an unsatisfactory answer here, Michael, but uh, it, it, it's all of the above. Um, remember earlier I mentioned how after I've decided my opinion on the stock or the underlying, am I bullish or am I bearish or am I neutral? After, after I've decided that, then, then the very next thing I do is determine where the implied volatility is. When, I, right. when I've determined the implied volatility, that's going to steer me into the direction of what strategy I'm going to use. So let's just use some examples here. If volatility is low and I'm bullish, I tend to like to really just keep it simple and buy calls. I mean, I don't want to get, I don't need to get any more complicated than that. If, if, if calls are cheap, then just buy the call so much easier. And generally speaking, if volatility is cheap and therefore calls are cheap, I will like, I will try to go further out in time because I'm, it's more affordable to go further out in time. I get more bang for the buck if I get it right and a really big trend to develop. So, you yeah. know, we're in we're in okay. February right now as we're talking. If if volatility is scraping the lowest levels it's been in for a year in a certain name, you know, I might look out nine months, twelve months uh, option strike okay. just to give myself as much time for my thesis to 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 play to work out. And the I strike that I select, generally speaking, if I'm buying calls. I like to buy the 25 delta strike. So that's going to be an out of the money call. It's going to be above the current price level. Um, mm -hmm. There's no magic in 25 delta, Michael. I get this question all the time. Like, why 25 delta? What, what's, what's, what back test tells you that that's the best one? No back test tells me it's the best one. Yeah. I like it because at 25 delta, to me, it's the right mix of affordability and leverage if I get it right. Yeah. Meanwhile, cheap enough that if I get it wrong, it doesn't hurt that much. I didn't risk a whole lot of, of my capital. Uh, so that's yeah. why I like the 25 Delta. If, if you like I to buy it. the 30 Delta, if you like to buy the 40 Delta, fine. Like there's no yeah. right answer. Everything in options trading is a trade off, right? Like For if sure. you want to make more money, you have a, a, a lower probability of success. If you want to have a high probability of success and, and win more often than you lose, you can do that too, but you're not going to make as much money, right? There's always right. a balance. I appreciate that. I appreciate the honest answer. I vacillated between, you know, 25 and 50s. In recent times, I've been 
you know, buying a lot of at the money stuff just because the moves are so strong, which really kind of brings me to the next question is, you know, if you see a move, let's let's take a, a move that a lot of folks probably would know in some of these AI stocks. You know, NVIDIA broke out over like whatever it was, 505. And uh, at this time, what last night it was up, you know, 708. So you're in calls that are, you know, going either, you know, at the money to in the money very, very quickly, or like you with 25 deltas, they're eventually getting to be, you know, at the money, then in the money. Is there a best practice for like knowing when to roll, right? Because sometimes these moves, you know, you have $30 move overnight, you can't roll to the next strike. You're, you're oftentimes the rolling you're dealing, you might have 30, 40, $50 in between strikes. So do you enter spreads or do you attempt to offset the winner and then immediately go back to your next 25 Delta? Like, how does that work? Because also the volatility might have changed. Yeah, that's a good question. And it, what I tend to do, and I'm not saying this is the best way or the only way, but what I tend to do in a, in a situation like that where I've got a big winner, it's going my way. Generally speaking, when I get into a trade, I have a plan, right? I, I know mm -hmm. where I'm getting out. I know where my stop loss is. That's, e that's the easier part. I also have a plan for if things go my way, right? I have a yeah. upside price target. It's not a firm target. It's more like an area usually. Uh, but in my mind, what I do is if I get to that price target where I'm sitting in a nice profit, a best practice that I will do often is I will sell or get out of a portion of my position that pays me back my original risk capital. So whatever I initially invested in dollar terms, I'll sell enough to get that money back. And then I'll hold the rest. I like to call it a free ride, right? Hashtag free ride. I got a free ride on the rest, no matter what happens. Um, I've got no risk in the trade. Yes, I'm risking open profits, but I'll risk open profits all day long. Uh, but I don't want to risk my original capital. So. Yeah, I got you. I kind of borrow from my futures trading strategy, which is I tend to be very stingy at the beginning and use lots of time stops. But then once I start making money, I quickly actually scale and buy more. Mm -hmm. It's called the moron strategy. <laughs> <Just> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> well, Michael, I've actually I've actually come around on this. I've, I've changed my thinking in, in recent and over really the past year up, up until about a year ago. My, my best practice, and I was pretty firm on this, um, was if I had a position on and the, the spread or if it's just a long call or a long put, if it doubled in money, then I would always sell half of my position. And again, taking my original risk capital out and then let the rest ride. And, yeah. and, and that's fine and that works. But I, after reviewing a lot of my trades, I said, man, Sean, you're really leaving a lot of money on the table. Why not let these things go to that price target you have in mind and then sell a little bit, you know, maybe just 20% of your position mm -hmm. or 10% of your position, get paid back your original risk capital. And you still got, you know, a, a large position to potentially, you know, go to the moon as the kids like to say, right. It, it only takes a couple moonshots to make yeah. your year. You know, it's trading is great because it's the, the outside of jujitsu. I don't know of any another thing that could completely humble you. Right. So, I did a similar study and, you know, people like to say systems remove emotion or whatever. And I, I mean, it, they don't know what they're talking about. Bill Dunn, who, when he's retired now, but he would talk about the emotions running through his body. And that guy was purely systematic, right? So when I, because I, I kind of journal everything, when I think of where I'm emotionally like, okay, I'm in, I, I bought, say I bought, you know, you know, with like in the NVIDIA stuff, those calls, the at the monies were like twenty, thirty dollars with fifty delta. But they go in the money so fast, you're looking at five times your capital. And so emotionally, you're like, Well, I gotta protect my capital. I have to put in a stop. If the market's going par parabolic, sooner or later it's gonna fall apart. Parabolas don't end all that well. And I don't know exactly when, but there will be a mean reversion, even if the move kind of continues. So you're dealing with all this stuff in your head. It's insanely difficult to back test with options. So I looked and I found that when I feel emotionally like I better take some money off the table, if I actually bought the underlying at that point, I would have made more money kind of like to your point. So your emotions can betray you and stop you from making more money, not just get you into bad trades. Like the emotional part can hijack your behavior every step of the way. 
in your preparation to your order tickets to your you know your morning prep to the execution to what I call managing the trade like what do you do when you're in the trade to me I immediately put in a protective stop and then I set alerts as it's making me money sometimes I add you know add more but then I adjust my stops higher so I like to kind of keep the position might be bigger but I like to kind of keep you know, I, as the saying in baseball is, I want to steal second without taking my foot off first base. So I try uh-huh. to keep a constant risk. I don't want 10% of my capital going directionally. And that's not 10% of the premium. That's the distance between where we are and where my stop is. You know what I'm saying? So so, so it's a little different. But it's, you know, it's important. I, uh, Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Yeah, um, I had the good fortune when I first moved to Colorado uh, a little over 11 years ago. Um, to strike up a friendship with someone that you may know, uh, Peter Brandt, a commodities trader, been around a long time. Um, he's uh, He was featured in the most recent uh, Market Wizards book uh, that came out from Jack Schwager the, uh, a couple of years ago. Um, Peter li- lived here in Colorado. He's since moved, but uh, but uh, he uh, we got together a few times. And, and one of the, the things that I learned from Peter the first time we hung out, uh, which has always stuck with me because he's been trading – now for 50 years or something like that. And he's done fantastically well. He's made many millions of dollars throughout his career. Although you'd never know it. He's the most humble guy uh, in person. <laughs> you would never know. Um, but the, one of the things he said to me, Michael, he said, he's like, Sean, in, in all my years of trading, getting out of losing trades has never been hard for me. I always have a plan. I always have a stop in. I take small losses all the damn time. He's like, the hardest trades in the world for me mm. are the trades that immediately go, go in my favor because every bone in my yeah. body has seen has seen this movie before where the thing rips in my favor and then immediately rolls back over and stops me out. He's like, so every bone in my body wants to take that profit and get out of that trade because I know it's going to come back on me. But those trades, and this goes back to what I was saying before, those trades that start ripping immediately, those are always my biggest winners. That's what my biggest winners look like. So I actually yeah. learned that from Peter. Uh, I've only finally started to implement that thinking into my trading. It only took 10 years after he first told me <laughs> to finally let that sink in. But um, yeah, man, it's it's the emotions you battle. And, and, and it's counterintuitive to somebody who's new to trading or considering trading and has never traded before. Yeah. It's counterintuitive to be like, Oh, a winning trade, that's hard and, and losers are easy. But yeah, the winning yeah. trades are the hardest trades to hold in my, in certainly sure. been my experience. Yeah, I, I, I feel the same way. And I we you know we teach to that too. Like you have to have a plan for when it doesn't work. You have to have a plan. Like the old saying on the street is, if the market gives you a gift, you have to take it. <laughs> and there is partial wisdom in that. But, you know, I've gotten comments, you know, via email and comments on the blog on some of the videos where like you could tell the guy has no experience or their armchair quarterback. And they're like, dude, every, every breakout has a pullback. And I'm like, no, it doesn't, you know, grow some hair on your nuts before you start talking and telling me about trading. Like sometimes these things go and they don't stop. So, you right. know, to just say nine, nine times out of 10, it's like, you know, you, you need to do your history. You need, you need to do your research and know what the hell you're talking about. The, the 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 most expensive trade to a person could be taking a winner too soon. Absolutely, you know? absolutely. And it's often times we've seen that. Like, we've seen that so many times. More more times than I than I care to, you know. I've had my share of gigantic winners because I tend to trade aggressively when things are going very well. But the ones that bother you are the moves that take off that you're not participating in, or the ones that you don't have enough on. And you know it's like your trade. So you say, okay, well, then how can you learn from that? How can I screen better? What was the catalyst that made this thing move? It wasn't just a breakout to a new high. Maybe maybe there was a news event, which is kind of hard to predict, right? So you you look at that, but you're constantly evolving. Like you never stop learning. You're always looking at your behavior and trying to, you know, ascertain – you know, am I marrying my beliefs with my behavior? Because for me, behavior predicts where you end up in life. It doesn't, I don't care what anyone really knows about a certain commodity or an asset class. I, if you have trouble sleeping, trust me, I could tell you everything you need to know about the sugar market or soybean, yellow soybean stump or two. But that doesn't help me make money, right? That's not a trading tactic. That's a data point. 
Now, 30 years ago, when the internet didn't exist, if you had that type of information, it would mean something. But the whole encyclopedic knowledge now of any type of thing is always a Google search away. So I tend to look at behavior and what is it that I know how to do that I could execute, that I could kind of quantify or journal or and that might even be like certain sensations or feelings that I get or hunches. I actually write that down. Okay, where's the hunch? Where did it come from? Was it a news was it a news thing? So I'm not really big on TV. Did I notice something in the chart? Did really, really bearish news come out on the name or what you what people would think would be bearish news, but yet the price didn't budge and it still inched a little higher? Like all that kind of information tells you a lot about what's going on in the marketplace. So and I think it's just, um, just listening to yourself and listening to your body. One thing I've learned about myself, Michael, over the years is, and I don't know how it happens, but I'll have a trade on or a position on or just overall portfolio positioning. And I'll start noticing as I'm looking at my positions that I'm starting to get like a little cold sweat going. And I'm like, and I can't explain. I'm like, I'm not cold and I'm, I haven't been exercising, but all of a sudden I get like this cold sweat and more often than not, that's like my subconscious telling me, Sean, you need to make a change here. You need to get this position off the books or something. Uh, it, it's kind of amazing yeah. how that happens. And it took me a while to figure that out. But that's one thing that I get. I mean, what was it? George Sor Soros used to say that uh, if his back started hurting, it was time to get out of a position. I was just thinking about that. Yeah. Kind of the same thing. Yeah. I mean, at first I thought you were talking about that awesome Cuban food that we had in Venice <laughs> the last time you were oh, in Oh, yeah. We got to go back to that place. That was great. Yeah, her name was, uh, I think, Flav I actually interviewed her. Her name was, I want to say, Flavia Simbalista, who who would talk about that. I think she was like George's coach. And Victor, when Victor was working at Quantum Fund with 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 Jim Rogers and 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 George, he would say the same kind of a thing. He would he would feel, you know, his body would get a sensation and his back would start to hurt. Hey, and that would like a, be a, like like a, an int an uh, entry point to his system. Speaking of Jim Rogers, by the way, Michael, shout out to Jim Rogers. I had the very, very good pleasure of getting to meet him in person this past summer. I was, uh, I did a trip oh, to yeah. Southeast Asia. Me and my partner, Steve Strass, I went to Singapore and we just kind of cold emailed Jim Rogers. He didn't know me. I didn't know, yeah. you know, we've never met before. Uh, I cold emailed him and told him we were in town and we we're interviewing traders for a documentary. And to his credit, he's like, yeah, sure. Come on over. I'd love to meet you. And, and we ended oh, up spending awesome. two days with Jim. Uh, had some coffee, had some great conversation. Man, what a what a gem! Yeah. What a gem of a guy! Oh, 100 percent. I've had him. On, I actually he used to live near Columbia in that big house, and you know in uh, Morningside Heights. So I would see him in, uh, occasionally in New York City when I was in school, and then later on I would catch up with him, you know, for lunch or something, coffee in Santa Monica. And, you know, talk about the old times, talk about managing risk. And I've had some really good interviews with him. I probably should have him back on the show because I, I noticed one thing in my own behavior that that he and I shared was that when we were wrong, we were oftentimes early. So we started talking about, well, how do I how could I better position size? And that conversation actually led me to instead of going risk on, risk off, why don't I trade a smaller piece getting involved, like maybe one fifth my optimum size so that this way, if I'm, my accuracy is 40%, it'll be paper cuts as opposed to something that's more ego driven, like a plunging, like I buy, you know, 150, you know, New York gold contracts. Maybe you don't have to buy them all at once, you know, buy three lots of 50, see, get a feel for the market, see if it's going to move in your favor this way. Like you were saying, if the market moves against you, I don't want to get nailed on my first piece. I mean, on my entire or my optimal risk unit, I'll, I'll just take a small paper cut on the first, you know, the first entry. Yeah. So, um, again, so that's an emotional development for trading that we're talking about. Um, anything you want to say about the movie now that you opened your big mouth, you, the documentary, when is it going to be out? When can we see it? Uh, we expect, uh, at least the first couple episodes to be out, uh, by April. Uh, I hesitate to, right. to make any promises. It's, it's out of my hands. It's, it's in the hands of the, uh, producers and the editors and the people that make movie magic. But, uh, uh, I know we're getting close. It's, uh, slated to be eight episodes. We went to seven cities uh, throughout Southeast Asia, oh, interviewed nice. all kinds of traders and, and we visited some of the exchanges, uh, in these, uh, countries and it was uh, a wonderful experience and 
hopefully we've got some uh, some some great content out of it. Uh, we'll see. Dude, I have no doubt it's going to be great because that's just who you are. You're one of the good guys. Um, so I have one one question in closing before I also want to thank you because I know you're not a guy who's just sitting around watching reruns of uh, you know baseball games like I do. <laughs> you uh, you're very busy. What and everything that we've spoken about today. Are there any other like misconceptions or things that many people misunderstand about options, especially if they're kind of starting out? I think the biggest misconception about options is people who have no experience trading options just automatic, automatically assume that options are incredibly risky. Mm-hmm. Now, I know where that comes from. I know that yeah. people see that you could buy a call option and be wrong and lose 100% of the premium. And that sounds scary. And that makes for a great headline and, and certainly a, a good tool to scare people. Yes. It's a total loss. Yeah. Or you hear about the people who sell naked options, right? Naked calls yes. and something that gaps, you know, hundred percent against them or something like that. Yeah. Those things happen, but those things also happen in the equity markets and they also happen in the futures markets. And they certainly happen in crypto. It's not unique to options, but we're, if, you, if people are willing to do the work and just do a little bit of reading or just ask the right questions of the right people, you can find out that options trading actually can be very conservative. You could be, you know, yeah. we talked about the defined risk. You could, you could define yeah. your risk to be however much is comfortable for you, right? Maybe you're only comfortable yeah. risking $100 per trade. Fine. In the options market, right. you can craft trades they give you a possibility of winning, per- perhaps uh, winning incredibly, right? While still yeah. managing your downside and knowing how much you're going to lose, no matter what. That you know, the stock could go to zero, you could still know what your maximum risk is. So, yes, I understand why people can think that options can be uh, very risky, and certainly if you're doing it in certain ways, it can be. But that's not a blanket truth, right? Yeah. Options definitely give you a much better uh, option uh, uh, ability to be more conservative. I know that sounds crazy to some people. Well, I think in, in the context, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I, I look at the same thing too. Like people say, you're a commodity trader. You it's legalized gambling. You're a risk lover. You love <laughs> gambling. I was like, no, I really don't myself. Every, every, I've played games of skill at casinos, you know, you know poker games and, and blackjack and this and that. So when I think about losing your total investment, if I break up my money in one, you know, 25 basis point increments, right, I have 400 chances to be wrong. So if I put down, right, $2,500 for every million and I lose it, sure, it's a total loss, but I still have 99.75% of my starting capital. So for me, it's the same thing. I don't, I don't really have a loss. Even if I have 99% of my capital, I would still figuratively say, I still have all my money. You know what I mean? Yes, for sure, right. it's a loss, but you, we make and lose our money from our account balance, from our position sizing. And that, to me, is like where the best traders really have an exceptional understanding of risk, and they know how to position size. The entries and the exits, they can be super sloppy. Obviously, if you're trading a tiny account, you know, slippage and skid probably is more meaningful for you. But once you start making some money, that stuff becomes incidental. Yeah. You know, it it look, doesn't as, mean, mean anything. As much as everybody would love to just rid themselves of the scourge of losing trades, the fact of the matter is losing yeah. is a fact, is, is, is a course of business. It, it, it's an essential part of what we do. You will lose. And, and depending on what type of strategy you're employing, you might lose frequently. I mean, you and I both know traders who are fantastically successful, who have a yeah. win rate of 30%, right? But you make a huge living with 30% accuracy. Absolutely. Absolutely. So losing is a part of the game. We're not going to get rid of it, but it's how you lose that separates the winners from the losers. Well, you're a winner, man. I appreciate you being here and taking the time. We're coming up on an hour. I definitely want to know more about the movie when the time I'll make sure to help you promote it. And then uh, we'll have you back on the show in a couple months, talk more about options. Maybe we'll do a little something or uh Maybe you know it would be great if we did like a live stream. We did like a demo or a live stream on something. I've been kind of toying with that idea. You certainly would be at the top of the list for doing that thing. Um, thank you, Sean. I appreciate you being here. I appreciate all your wisdom. 
Well, Michael, you've always been good to me. I'm always happy to help out. And uh, next time I'm in the LA area, let's grab some Cuban food again. Come on, Brian. It's waiting for you right now. All right. Thanks so much.